Hi everybody, uh, Andy here. Just before we start this week's show, we have an announcement to make. Um, it's a bit of a serious one. It's that for a while we are not going to be able to record our podcast from our, our spiritual home, our, our Covent Garden office anymore. Um, and there's a simple reason for that. And the reason is that we are going on tour, baby! That's right, I tricked you all! It wasn't bad news, it's good news! You thought someone had died. Quite the reverse, we're going to be on tour, live and amplified, across the entirety of the UK and Ireland. We're going to be going all over the shop. Are we going to Barnstable? You bet your bum we're going to Barnstable. Are we going to Pool? As a rule, we're going to Pool. And 25 other places across the UK, and of course, not to forget Dublin. I know what you're thinking, what's the show going to involve? Well, I'll tell you, it's going to be a live, new, fresh podcast right for your ears in the second half every single night, all the bits that are actually too funny to put out in the edited version of the show, and the first half is going to be an extraordinary cavalcade of different things. So much different stuff is going to happen in the first half. Elephants, dancing girls, dancing boys, fireworks, Dan's famous avocado trick, and a number of other things that I really probably shouldn't actually be promising to you. But Andy, 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 how do we get our tickets? It's very simple, everybody. All you have to do is go to no such thing as a fish.com, find the nearest one, and click book. That's it. No such thing as a fish.com. That's it. It's going to be so much fun. We cannot wait to see you there. If you're not there, we'll talk about you behind your back. All right, that's it. On with the show. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Covent Garden. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting at a ginormous distance from Andrew Hunter Murray, James Harkin, and Anna Tashinsky. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that Nate Mercero, who produced the most recent album of Grammy-winning R&B star Leon Bridges, has now started collaborating with actual Bridges. <laughs> when you're onto a winner, right? <laughs> yeah. Just stick with it. How many um, elements of your fact had you heard of before discovering this, I'd, James? Be I'd, honest. I'd heard of Bridges. That's what I suspected. <laughs> the Grammys. You must have heard of the Grammys. Heard of the yeah. Grammys, yeah. R&B so stars. I was reading an article in The Guardian about the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, which started making this weird sort of humming noise. Um, but a local musician um, made some singles where he does a duet with the bridge. And when I say local musician, I mean extremely famous record producer, <laughs> Nate Mercero. Um, but I'd never heard of him, so I Googled him. And it turned out that he's worked with people like Jay-Z and with Lizzo, uh, who I have heard of. And also a guy called Leon Bridges, <laughs> who I hadn't heard of, but he has got the word Bridges in his name. <laughs> Good enough. Good and enough he's won me. a bunch of awards, so he's obviously very famous. And I think that's my problem, not his. <laughs> <laughs> Do they call it? Bridges Over Troubled Water, this new collaboration with the bridge. They don't call it that. No, I think he went for more that artistic than the punny. Mm. Mm. I think Simon and Garfunkel are quite, I imagine they're quite litigious. I wouldn't want to get up in their face with that. Are Simon and Garfunkel still alive? Yeah, both. Both. Yeah. Yeah. Not both of them, surely. Both still alive. If, you, if you've I... seen them perform on stage, you wouldn't know, but... Wow. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> you know what? I'm thinking of Paul Newman. Not Paul Simon, who's very not still alive. Well, yeah, Newman and Garfunkel is a very <laughs> <laughs> interesting goal. Uh, so this um, Golden Gate Bridge um, collaboration, yeah. I listened to it, it's really good. Yeah. It's, so you see the bridge in the background, and it's just making this weird noise, and then Nate Mercero kind of shambles on after a minute, where the bridge is, frankly, holding the stage very well. <laughs> and he start, But he starts adding some guitar sound over the top of it to kind of match it and... And, and move around it and it sounds really eerie and great yeah, yeah. it is spooky he likened mm. it to Tibetan singing bowls didn't he which oh, yes. those Sweet. things that I just um, got one of those did you, you? Yeah. I've seen it yes mm. yeah. nice. why did you buy one of those Dance. I mean I have one but I went to 
to Tibet. <laughs> <laughs> well, the guy in the shop who sold it to me said it's either from Tibet or it's from Wales. And he wouldn't <laughs> go- confirm either way where it was from. Dan sent me to a witchcraft shop to buy it. It yes. was great. He says, I bought mine in Tibet, <laughs> wow. in Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, from a guy called Alan Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, because they don't actually have anything to do with Tibet. So that Tibetan's just ripping you off. Why, why do they get the Tibet name then? Um, I think it's just one of those Western, uh, let's make it sound cool and spiritual and it's from somewhere over there but yeah India or Nepal but apparently I was reading about the dangers of singing bowls and I wonder if the bridge has the same dangers you can get a headache from them so Andy be careful Thank you. yeah and if you're pregnant which I don't know if you are then it, they don't know if it will affect it but they advise not to risk it what? But, uh, who? <laughs> <laughs> this was just a website listing the risks of Tibetan singing bowls. So pregnant women can't listen to Tibetan singing bowls. Don't, just don't risk it. We don't know oh, that don't it would do it. any yeah, damage. Yeah. But, but that's. Could we virtually say we don't know anything that will risk pregnancy if we haven't tested it? Like, yeah, presumably, I, no doctor's gone. Uh, do you know what I'm going to focus on this week? <laughs> seeing how this affects pregnancy, <laughs> Tibetan singing bowls. Yeah, that's correct. So I think this website is leaning heavily on the safe side. And yeah, don't don't risk moving, listening to anything. But look, that's my advice. Okay. Very strange. Oh, okay. So um, this, it was quite hard to get the recording of the Golden Gate Bridge um, because basically the reason it's humming is that the wind is going through it. Uh, they put some new slats on the bridge's railings, which is supposed to stop it from getting in trouble in high winds. Um, but all it's done is means that when the wind goes through it it makes this kind of eerie sound (laughs) Um, but also it means that when you try and record it necessarily it's going to be a windy day and so it's really hard to get the sound of the bridge as Mm. well as this and kind of get rid of the sound of the wind but good on Nate Mercer managed it yeah Yeah. he found the cove didn't he 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 had to go down this cove which was partially blocked by the wind and then in order to get all the equipment uh, working they had to bring a car battery down to power it all and so yeah it was a proper process the wind supposedly plays in the note of A. So if you want to go and collaborate with it, that's your note to go with, um, which is what... Does it? I thought it had a range. Does it not? Well, it 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 emits a 440 hertz hum. And so, yeah, it probably Hmm. oscillates, but it wibbles around a bit. Yeah. So one person said you could tune your oboe to it because that's that's what your oboe is. What a difficult and pointless way of tuning an oboe. (laughs) (laughs) If you live in San Francisco, though. And you're an oboist. (laughs) Yeah. And open your window. Get tuning. (laughs) It's nice because uh, Strauss, who is the guy who built the bridge, engineer near the bridge said not when, Richard Strauss but not Richard Strauss no <laughs> Joseph Strauss he was uh, trying to build a massive oboe <laughs> <laughs> He described it as saying, as harps for the winds of heaven, my web-like cables are spun. So he wow. imagined his bridge as a harp that could be played by the heavens. That's really mm. romantic mm. for a bridge maker, isn't it? That's very poetic, mm. yeah. It's an amazing bridge. I'd never really read about it before or learned anything about it because I've, I've not been to San Francisco. But it's 1.7 miles long. Um, and it's across the Golden Gate Strait. Obviously, it's not a golden bridge. It is red. red no, it's orange, sorry. Yeah. International orange. International orange. It has its own paint colour. Yeah. But it could so nearly have been a no such thing as a fish-themed bridge. Yes. Did you guys find this? Yeah. The US Navy wanted to paint it in black and yellow stripes. In honour of no such thing as a fish. Yeah. <laughs> 80 years, Avon La Lettre. But yeah, yeah. It could have been so cool. And it arrived, didn't it, in the colour that it is now, close to the orange. And when they saw that, they went, actually, that aesthetically would work for incoming ships as well. And it looks much better than this weird giant warning sign yeah. <laughs> across the bay. Although um, I'm sceptical about that. So yeah, they said, I think the Navy wanted that and the um, Army Air Corps wanted a red and white colour scheme so it's visible from the air. And yeah, everyone says, oh, we saw the base layer, which was this orange colour, and we thought that's perfect. But I think what they thought was, we've got a fucking massive bridge here. Yeah. Do we really want to bother painting the whole thing again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In two colours. Yeah. In two yeah. colours, yeah. <laughs> Nightmare. There's a great story. So it had two openings, didn't it? The bridge. It had a pedestrian in and opening, out, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the, there's four openings in total, in and out. And then when they actually <laughs> opened it, uh, they did one day for pedestrians, and then they did another day for the actual automobiles going across. And on the day that it opened to pedestrians, eighteen thousand people crossed it, and. Many of the 18,000 wanted to set a record of being the first to do something on it. So the first person to get across it was a sprinter called Donald Bryant. Uh, So he was the first man to run across it. There were uh, Esther and Anne Bullard, who were the first recorded twins. Carmen and Minnie Perez were the first skaters. Florentine Caligari was the first on stilts. 
Uh, there was a Scotty, which was the first dog. Um, police rushed to aid one woman who was staggering along with her tongue out, and it turns out she was just trying to become the first woman to cross it with her tongue out. Why was she staggering? <laughs> Did she have a very heavy tongue or something? I think she was, it's a long walk, as you said. It's a long bridge. Has anyone gone across it while doing a podcast? Oh, mm. great shout. Very not cool. in not in 1937, <laughs> anyway. Um, the first rope to be taken across, which was taken across by Boy Scout Troop Number 5 of San El Salmo <laughs> by their clubmaster. That, I had a slim pickings at what? that stage. Do you think it's someone who's got to the end with their tongue out? And someone's gone, no, someone's already done this. Yeah. And they've looked in their pockets. They're like, well, I've got a bit of rope here. Has yeah, anyone exactly. taken a rope over? <laughs> Uh, there's a brilliant book called Building the Golden Gate Bridge, A Worker's Oral History by Schwartz Harvey, where he spoke to all the different people who worked on it. I think we said before that when they built it, they put a massive net underneath the bridge so mm. that if anyone fell down, they fell into that giant net. Um, but people who actually fell in there and survived joined a supposed club called the Halfway to Hell Club. Mm. Uh, there was someone there who worked on it who said it was the coldest place they ever worked. You had to put on all the clothes you owned and you had to carry on working, otherwise you would just freeze while you were doing it. Wow. And there was no women working on the bridge, um, but there was a woman called Deweese Bowen um, who was working as a nurse for all the men who were working on the bridge. And she said that what would happen is that their wives would come and visit them and they would always bring them like some bread or salami or some wine. And then the men would always give it to the nurses. And so they would always say to the nurse, make sure you wear a cape tomorrow. <laughs> And what they would do is they would take their cape and they would hide all the goodies under the cape and then like have a midnight snack. Oh, nice. Which is kind of cool, isn't it? Uh, but it was really, really dangerous. But the people who worked on it really needed the work. And so there were out of work men who would routinely line the sides of the Golden Gate Bridge and they were waiting for someone to either quit or fall off the bridge so that they could <laughs> really? fall off. Wow. Yeah, honestly. But it was actually safer than other construction projects because Joseph Strauss, a bit ahead of his time in health and safety terms, was really into things like hard hats it was the first time hard hats were compulsory he put this big net under it it had like it had a lower death rate than most construction projects mm. although some people still died obviously but it still does sound terrifying i think i was reading in the same book an account by a guy who was describing how he was employed to work on it and you took an elevator up through one of the towers right up to the top so it's 710 feet you go up in this elevator and he remembers going up for the first time with two painters who were employed to paint it and the elevator opened at the top and it opened onto a two foot wide wooden plank, which you had to walk across to get onto the <laughs> wow. scaffolding. And the two painters said to the elevator operator, well, what are we supposed to do now? And the operator said, well, you walk across that. So they immediately quit and asked to be taken back down wow. again. Yeah. And God. then, but this guy went for it. So stressful, especially if you've got a row of people shouting at you hope in the hope that you will fall off <laughs> yeah. standing on the sides. Yeah. Oh, you missed a bit, mate. Just go a bit further, <laughs> yeah. a bit further out on the plank. I think still like if you're a maintenance worker on there, you have to do this thing on the second day they make you walk on a cable which is 36 inches in diameter but with only a 12 inch strip down the middle that you have to stay on because the rest of it's really slippy oh, and that bit isn't right. slippy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's your test to get the Pretty the much, yeah. Right. There's a guy called Greg Montereno and he said, if you can't walk the cable, there's no day three. God, so that's... how is that interview process when you go in? <laughs> how are you with not falling off bridges? <laughs> um, this hum, by the way, is as a result of them trying to make the bridge safer yeah. as well. So they spent ages trying to work out what was causing this hum because it came out of nowhere and they worked out that it was these new thinner slats that put, were put on the bridge that were meant to help it withstand wind because the wind is so great in that area and the bridge at the moment can stand something in the vicinity of 69.34 miles per hour that's sort of what it's built something for, in the roughly. vicinity of 69.34 <laughs> so can it do 69.35 miles an hour something or? in that vicinity yeah <laughs> yeah but not that that's too high by point Oh, one. Um, it's around 69 miles per hour and it has gone beyond that. It's gone up to 75 miles per hour and it's managed to stay up. But they are worried that if it went higher than that, the whole bridge could collapse. So these new slats are designed to allow it to withstand 100 mile per hour winds. But that's what caused the hums in the end. Um, and they're going to try and fix it now. So this might be the only collaboration that the bridge does, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, bridges do tend to make noises anyway. 
I was reading about a musician called Jodie Rose, who is really obsessed with the sound of bridges. And she's released albums of bridge noises called, I think there's one called Singing Bridges. Ah. I was listening to one. It's kind of nice. Um, Don't listen if you're pregnant to a singing bridge. Oh, if it's Tibetan, God, no. you can't listen to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Actually, it's a myth that singing bridges are originally Tibetan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's great. She's, she's recorded bridges uh, like the Millennium Bridge, the Batman Bridge in Tasmania, uh, in Finland, Rotterdam, Vietnam. She's travelled all over the world on really? the profits that she makes from selling her bridge-based sound albums. What's she yeah. listening to? Is yeah. it people on the bridge or is it these bridges? Can I just that, say, like, I've walked across the Millennium Bridge on many, many occasions and never noticed the sound. Uh, she puts a microphone on the actual cables so you catch the creaking and, and I guess when you walk across it, maybe your oh. ear isn't pinned to the cables themselves. Well, it is, because I'm trying to be the first person to cross it with my <laughs> ear pinned to the ground. <laughs> so there are mysterious hums around the world, around the universe, in fact. Mm. Voyager 1 spacecraft has just managed to detect the background hum of interstellar space for the first time. Apparently, really? the universe hums. That's, that's so good that the universe is going, hmm. hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think it's sceptical? Mm. Yeah, not sure. I think sure. disapproving. <laughs> yeah, mm. not sure. Yeah. Um, there is a constant hum of interstellar plasma, apparently, and it's caused when a star such as the sun sends out a coronal mass ejection, which is something we discussed the other day with Robin Ince, then it will fire into this plasma and kind of make it the electrons sort of vibrate a little wow. bit and you can and you can measure that yeah. it's going to be a whole grammy category for this one day isn't there <laughs> <laughs> on collaborations you know horses ears sometimes hum do they <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's right um this was <laughs> Can't believe you guys didn't you said know that, that like you had to convince yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I am right. looking at my nose and thinking, can this be true? <laughs> but yeah, in 1995, vets at Newmarket were doing some surgery on a horse's lip, mm. and they noticed that its ear was emitting a sound, a bit like the sound you hear when you've got a bit of tinnitus, yeah, like yeah. a beeping sound. <laughs> and they didn't know why, but I went on Horse and Hound forum, and other people have had this problem. I think humans have it sometimes. Yes, humans do get it. Objective tinnitus. Extremely rare, Objective much much so more rare than subjective tinnitus. It's making a ringing noise. Your ear makes a ringing noise. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Whoa. So, you know, if you have tinnitus, go to the ENT surgeon just in case they have a listen and go, yeah, you're right. No, yeah. it's not It's not in your head. Well, well it is in your head, but... It's going to be annoying if Nate Mercereau follows you around with his guitar <laughs> just trying to make songs. <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is Anna. My fact this week is that dragonflies used to be the same size as modern day pigeons. Wow. wow. Terrifying. Yeah. Really yeah. Frightening fact. So bad. No, because dragonflies are beautiful and cool. That's and true, and fun. pigeons are not. You're right. Oh, I if don't I, know, they're if scary. You re- if you, all right, James, if you could replace every pigeon in the world with a dragonfly of equivalent size, would you? A hundred percent. And I really? think I'm not. Everyone would, wouldn't they? I, think I, I love Actually, pigeons. I would too. Yeah. What? Yeah, uh, we found the, the real fault line in fish after seven oh. years. Oh, the dragonflies. Well, dragonflies, prior to reading this, I would have been fine with it. Having now read what they're like, <laughs> I, I think they're terrifying creatures. What were they like? They weren't that bad. Okay, so they were larger than your average dragonfly. And they were, in fact, the largest insect ever, probably. This is about 300 million years ago in the Paleozoic era. And they're called Meganeura. Sometimes they're referred to as griffin flies. And they had a 70 centimetre wingspan, about 40 centimetres long. And yeah, they're the grandparents of the modern dragonfly. They would be able to hunt larger things than they can hunt today, I guess. But yeah, they were the biggest flying things, basically, until reptiles started flying. They were the biggest things you'd ever see in the sky. Amazing. Wow. So cool. They're really interesting things. And they were allowed to get this big because the oxygen levels in the air were so high at the time. There were 40% oxygen in the air as opposed mm. to 21 now. Mm. So they just had a lot more potential power in the air around them. I How suppose. big would we have been, though, if we were around then? Huge. I always say this. I think this is ridiculous. <laughs> you always find these fossils <laughs> of, like, giant dragonflies, giant millipedes, like, giant reptiles. Yeah. Where are the giant humans? Mm, Where yeah. are they? You've oh, blown yeah. the shit wide open. <laughs> Darwin is turning in his grave. <laughs> uh, the answer is we would not necessarily been that much bigger because they were large because they breathe in a different way to us so mm. they don't have any lungs insects they essentially breathe through little holes spiracles, spiracles. exactly yeah. in their skin and actually scientists don't really know how they get enough oxygen to themselves at all because and i learned this fact which i found amazing while researching this each oxygen molecule if it was moving through empty air it could move at about half a kilometer per second Whoa. but 
because it crashes into other molecules so often it goes one centimeter a second so every second it has 10 billion collisions so that's basically like imagine you're an insect Mm. and you've just got these holes which are waiting for an oxygen molecule to drift Mm. in and there's an oxygen molecule you know 10 centimeters away it's making billions and billions and billions of collisions. It's never going to get to you. Okay. Yeah. So this is why in the olden days when oxygen was more concentrated, they could get more oxygen inside their bigger bodies, but now they can only really get them on the surface of their bodies. So as soon as they get too fat, they can't breathe anymore. If they've got too much you know, meat in their body, the How oxygen molecules can't right. go in. Whereas we suck oxygen in. We you know, right. we use our diaphragm. Question, because they eat a lot and they eat a lot quite quickly. Mm-hmm. So... If let's say, imagine we were the the thing they were eating. How much oxygen is inside us at this moment? Well, are we talking me? about the big dragonflies from the past at the moment? Well, shrink me down no to a modern day <laughs> right, dragonfly. So you've been shrunk down in <laughs> yeah. some kind of weird "Honey, I Shrunk the Kids" yeah. movie to the size of a dragonfly. No, I'm I'm the, um, the size of a dragonfly's prey. Prey, exactly. Oh, like a mosquito. Like a mosquito. Uh-huh. Right, okay. Okay. Yeah. Dan Keto, right? Yeah. <laughs> need so does the Dan Keto yeah. right now? Do I have oxygen inside my body? Yes. Yeah. So here's the question. If it's that big an eater and it's eating all these things, can you eat oxygen? Are you eat if he, is the dragonfly eating my oxygen as well as the food that brings in the oxygen? I think that yeah. you would utilize your oxygen relatively quickly. I think. And also there wouldn't be much oxygen in you compared to the amount of your body. Mm. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You're yes. not like a balloon I'm not where a you're balloon. completely full of oxygen. Yeah. You've got mini Dankito lungs which have got a bit of oxygen in them. Okay. But that's not look. That's not a terrible question. I have to say because they don't have I, part I, of it was quite terrible. I thought that I thought I think it's quite a good question. They don't have lungs, so they can't breathe it in. Yeah, so what yeah. are you going to do? You're going to eat it You're in. Eat the oxygen. What do you eat? You eat other things that breathe. And yeah, they don't have much oxygen in them, but it's a bit, isn't it? Yeah. Also, the question is whether your stomach can dissolve the oxygen as well as your lungs or spiracles can. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. I don't really understand the premise of Dan's question. <laughs> I've just got Dan as a mosquito in my head now. <laughs> Quite irritating, aren't they, mosquitoes? Yeah. <laughs> um, dragonflies. Yeah. yeah. Are not. They're, they're, they're misnamed, I would say. They're not. Dragons or flies. Exactly. And they don't spend most of their life flying. They spend years of their life as larvae mm. living in water. Moving around, eating away, breathing through their bottoms. That's the majority of their life. Breathing through their bottoms, you say? Yeah. Mm, they do. Cool. Can If they were to shove something up their bum which had oxygen in it, would they be able to... L- like Dan, a be, mosquito like Dan Keto, yeah. <laughs> Put me up the bum. I don't think this reboot of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is going to work, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I find that amazing that so many animals live an eternal youth and then just a very brief adulthood. How cool is that? Mm. Lucky buggers. <laughs> yeah. Imagine just being a teenager forever and then at the very end you've got this teenager, crappy adulthood bit. No, you don't want the teenager no. part. You want to be a child forever. Yeah, yeah okay. You're right. Yeah. They have terrifying childhoods as well. Or well, terrifying for everything around them because they're amazing hunters as adults, but also in the water. So they have this extendable jaw called a labium. Oh, yeah. And it looks like the thing in Alien. The Alien. Um, <laughs> which, <laughs> it's sort of fo- it's folded up. It's got this arm on a spring under its jaw. Mm-hmm. And when it sees prey passing by, that jaw shoots out and grabs it. Some species have pincers, some don't, but it's all terrifying. Really? And they're amazing hunters. Yeah, And it can, the way that the arm comes out of their mouth is it's hydraulic, isn't it? And they suck in water through their anus <laughs> and they use that water hydraulically to fire out the arm from their mouth. Oh, cool. Really? It's incredible. That's amazing. It genuinely is. Do, do we have any system like that on us? No, we don't have- <laughs> Do you think that you could have got this far in life and then suddenly someone tells you, oh, damn, by the way, no one's told you this so far, but if you soak water through your bum, a hand comes Dan, out of your next time you're just, the... I've just learnt my ears can hum. Like, that is new information <laughs> Next time you're in the bath, Dan, just give it a go. Try and grab the soap from across the bathtub. <laughs> but purposefully don't use my arms. Yeah. Just suck yeah, exactly. through my anus. Suck through your anus and see if your jaw shoots out. I, yeah. But it's really weird because they, they, yeah, as James says, they, they blast it out and they can use that... It sort of creates this massive pressure wave inside them, this water that they've sucked in. And then it generates a pound of pressure, which is quite a lot for a tiny dragonfly nymph. Mm. But they can also use it another way. They can use it as an escape mechanism because they can unclench, blast the water out, and then jet themselves away what? through yeah, the water. Awesome. So don't do that in the back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Go through the window into my neighbor's backyard. <laughs> 
they've, they've also got an amazing, this is when they're adults, their ability to hunt food is pretty spectacular. So they've been put in laboratories and, and scientists have watched the sort of rate of catch against the prey that they're going for. And it's a 95% of the time they can catch what they're aiming to catch. They're just absolute mega predators. This is one of those experiments, the way they looked at how they do this is one of those experiments where I think, how does scientists manage it? So they made a backpack for them and they strap it on. But then they, in order to look at what's happening in their neurons when they're hunting to mm. find out how their brain is doing this, they connect wires to the equivalent of their spinal cord. Okay. And you read the articles and it's just like they say this casually. Yeah, that's insane. How's someone doing that? Yeah. Well, they've got Dan in the lab in mosquito form. <laughs> Dan Keto to the rescue. <laughs> anyway, they discovered that they don't just react really quickly, they can predict where insects go. So they watch their neurons like firing and they watch an insect's trajectory and they can see which direction it's, it's going to really head. That's really clever. Yeah. Yes. Although like this morning I opened a cupboard in my house yeah. and some sugar fell out. And without even thinking, I caught it. So, wow. wow. You're the dragonfly of this podcast, oh basically. I'd rather that than the mosquito of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I mean, if anything, this means I get to hang out with Timothy C. Weingard, author of The Mosquito, A Human History of Our Deadliest <laughs> <laughs> Wait till he hears about the Dan Keto. <laughs> Do you guys know what doesn't get enough airtime in all this chat about dragonflies? Ooh. Um, Tell us. No. Damselflies. Damselflies. <laughs> what a guess. Wow. That was I'm Andy, surprised. Yeah. We are on the same page here. <laughs> um, I'm so glad you agree. They're basically dragonflies, but a bit smaller, and people don't know as much about them. So the way you can tell the difference between a damsel and a dragon is that damselflies hold their wings back against their body, whereas dragonflies can't do that. And also, dragonflies have their two eyes kind of like merged together at the front of their face, whereas damselflies have them on either side. But damselflies can climb underwater, even when they're adults, which dragonflies can't. So dragonflies Why lay their eggs. How do you climb, climb underwater? Well, good question. They climb backwards down a plant. Like, Some... like getting into a swimming pool with the ladder. Yeah. It's exactly like that. Yeah, yeah certain right. damselflies, they have to lay their eggs underwater. It's usually inside plant matter. And they, like you climb down a ladder of a pool, climb backwards down the stem of a plant, and they can be underwater for about half an hour. And they turn their wings half into... Half an a... hour? Yeah. So what's their oxygen intake like? Oh, God. Here we go again. <laughs> Dan Keto to the rescue. You can't do it, Dan. I'm just going to tell you okay. now. <laughs> they turn their wings into a kind of snorkel. Dan, are you all right in there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to be a damselfly. <laughs> <laughs> If you can work out how to trap an air bubble between your wings and then use that to breathe for half an hour. Oh, wow. That's very that. good. God, that's, really that's so cool. cool. Yeah. That's a human thing that I think we should nail. Trapping an air bubble. Well, we, we have underwater. scuba equipment. We do. Okay, that's solved. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, forget my hand bubble I wanted to invent. <laughs> This massive, massive um, dragonfly, the first one was discovered by a guy called Frank Carpenter, uh, who's in America, and he got into fossilized insects at the age of 14, and he was really, really into them, like, you know, wasn't into girls and, and football and stuff. He was just, all I want to do is look at fossilized insects. Nice. But he was like in a little town in Oklahoma, and what's he going to do? Well, luckily the local neighborhood postman called Waldo Dodge was also an amateur <coughs> entomologist. And he'd noticed that this young kid was getting loads of books about fossilized insects sent to his house. And he said, mate, I can help you. And he got him invited to the Cambridge Entomological Club nearby. Whoa. Uh, and then eventually he became a Harvard professor of entomology. And in 1992, just after his 90th birthday, he published his classification of fossil insects. <gasps> wow. That's a happy story. Isn't it? Starting at 14 and knowing what you yeah. want to do with your life all the way till 90. It's, That's really nice. That really cool. To have job satisfaction like that, yeah. dream of it. When he got the um, big dragonfly in the first place, it was part of a, um, a hunting trip where he and a colleague um, in 10 weeks managed to collect more than 5,000 fossil insects. In wow. Nice. Wow. What's that? 500 a week. So that's about how many a day? Let's about say eight, eight, eighty. Yeah, yeah. Pretty good. That's pretty. Damn for waking good. for waking hours, sixteen hours. That's five an hour. They're every gonna have hour. breaks. 
Yeah, you're right. It's more like 20 an hour if you have a lunch break mm-hmm. and maybe a little evening break to talk about all the fossilized insects. You find, where is this gold mine they're <laughs> looking for all their fossilized insects in? That's incredible. Well, I guess exactly. no one's looking for there them, There must right? have been a big pile somewhere exactly. and then they took the rest of the week off or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that guy. I love that postman's name, Waldo Dodge. I know. Yeah. So I know. good. I, uh, it was so much harder to find Waldo when he's got <laughs> Dodge capacities. <laughs> I have a little sideline where I collect the names of people which double as short sentences and Waldo Dodge is going on the list. Very cool. Who else is on the list? Uh, Nancy Drew, who I know is a fictional character, but Wesley Snipes, um, Cheryl Strayed is an author. Are you are you but, counting Waldo Dodge as like an imperative an imper- sentence? That is a B yeah, list I have created within my main list. <laughs> if you put a comma after Waldo and an exclamation mark after Dodge, it works as an imperative, doesn't yeah, it? Exactly. Absolutely, yeah, exactly. But imperatives are, are a lower category. Than, I agree. But so punctuation is allowed into They're them. not a proper sentence. Ger- no, no, no. Well, I mean, you know, there's no main verb. But oh my God, you, you, Andy's Ro- literally brought the list up on his phone here. Rosa Parks, Jeremy Irons, <laughs> Eric Pickles. <laughs> you know, they're just Sean Combs. <laughs> no, he Coombs. I think Coombs, yeah. Oh, is it? Sean Coombs is her. <laughs> <laughs> but then it could be an imperative. Puff, daddy. <laughs> there we go. He's back on the list. <laughs> or P, Diddy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that Germany's parliament has 709 real politicians and one fictional one. So oh, cool. How do they tell the different way? <laughs> satire. Is so, that satire? <laughs> it's as close as I get. What are, we, what are we saying? They're all, it's like they're all fake. No, it's Angela Merkel that she made up. It's not Angela Merkel. So this, this is the story of Jakob Maria Mierscheid. He is a father of four. He's a widower. He trained as a tailor. He's an expert on Columba Palumbus, which is a species of pigeon. He's someone who tried to make it so that the official transcripts of every final sentence from members' speech were banned from the record, since they always ended in the exact same thing. And thus, I conclude. Uh, And most notably of all, he is not real. He's completely made up and he has been recognized by all the members of their parliament over 40 years now. And he is a person that was on the official website. He had his own profile. He has his own Twitter account, but he doesn't exist. What's going on? So he was a fictional composite member to replace a guy who was called Carlo Schmidt, who was a founding father of Germany's constitution. And the name came from one former member of parliament and the date of birth from another. And they just created him as this this character to be a part of this little town. Just a joke, right? Just a typical German gag. gag. No particular reason. They like Carlo Schmidt. But everyone seemed to just like him as a character. And so he gets mentioned occasionally in the actual parliament. But does he ever swing a vote? No. Um, The Bundestag's website has a description of Mearscheid and it says, I am neither an invention nor a patent. I am a solution. So he's denying it. He says, like <laughs> constitutional lawyer Friedrich Nagelmann and professional diplomat Edmund F. Dracker, my colleagues in the judiciary and the executive with whom I enjoy working, I belong to the pillars of our state. Um, these two people, Friedrich Nagelmann and Edmund F. Dracker, are also fictional. It's very weird. And this seems to be a German thing, these kind of in-jokes. Like there's that town in Germany called Bielefeld, which is sort of the opposite. It's got a population of 350,000 people, all real but there's a running joke that it doesn't exist. Oh, yeah. And so all Germans know of it as not existing. It's the 18th largest city in Germany. But even Angela Merkel, last time she went there, made a speech there. And then the next day she went somewhere else and said, you know, I've just been to Bielefeld. Or oh, have I? Is it even real? That's really oh. Who knows? And then if you say, well, I've, actu- I've actually been to Bielefeld, so I know it's there. They go, oh, you're part of the conspiracy, are you? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The aliens are in your brain. That's so funny. I did find out a place that is in Germany and it's, it's not fictional, but it, it existed as a weird quasi-real entity just after the end of the Second World War. This mm-hmm. is really bizarre. It's a town called Schwarzenberg. It's near the border with what was Czechoslovakia. Um, and during the end of the war, both the Soviets and the American forces uh, stopped outside which is really strange because they had possibly miscommunicated about where everyone was going to stop their advance. So it seems to have been the last independent bit of German territory that wasn't occupied by the Allied powers. And they sort of denazified. The, the mayor had been an enthusiastic member of the party. They issued new stamps, new train schedules, and they, they imagined they were going to be a, a kind of Hong Kong yeah. territory. 
like independent from the rest of from the from the Germany. mainland if you like from mainland yeah. germany um and then after seven weeks the soviets heard there were uranium deposits there and invaded but Damn. it was it was a brief dream you've you know. got to hide those why had they stopped on either side is that like they couldn't agree who was going to come to meet who like you meet a friend it's like you come to me no you come to me like, <laughs> it is really weird i think they both agreed they were going to stop at a certain river and i think the river has a weird shape something or maybe the river has two bit maybe the river bisects I don't know the exact geography of Schwarzenberg. I'm sorry. I haven't done my homework here, but there was some miscommunication. Yeah. Damn that uranium. I found some other fake people, not necessarily Ooh, yeah. German. Walter Plinge. <laughs> <laughs> is that another one of your verby names? What is the verb to plinge? Is that like a, a small plunge? Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's what a, mate, what a damselfly does into the water. <laughs> Yeah, Walter Plinge, he is basically, we know the term Alan Smithy for movies where oh, yeah. you would put your you put that name down if you didn't want to be credited because something had gone wrong. Walter Plinge, kind of similar territory um, in that he can be used as that for British theatre in that mm. case. But also okay. it's when a part hasn't been cast, it will be said to be played by Walter Plinge or if an actor is playing two roles in the theatre, oh. one will be Benedict Cumberbatch. The other, Walter Plinge. Uh, I don't know if he's done that. But well, he, he has done that because he did Frankenstein. Except there was someone playing the other role, which was... Yeah. Johnny Lee Miller. Yes. Yeah. And, but they swapped roles each night. Yeah. yeah. So there was never a chance for Plinge to get in there, I yeah, see. If, if Johnny Lee Miller had been ill and Benedict Cumberbatch had to play both Frankenstein and the monster, that would have been a good chance to have Plinge. Plinge would have been right in there, yeah. yeah. There was a member of the J-pop band AKB48 called Aguchi Aimi mm. but she was completely fictitious she was computer generated so they took bits from all of the members of um, AKB48 because there's 48 or there used to be 48 members of them they took all different bits and put them all together to make this new member and it turned out that she was a publicity stump for Glyco Ice No Me which are grape flavoured ice balls Mm. Grape flavored ice balls. They yeah. need all the publicity they can get, don't they? They sound, uh, who's... Good. they sound good to me. Grape flavored ice balls. Yeah, yummy. lovely. Because if you like, any any glass of water can become a glass of wine if you just add some <laughs> yes. of this yeah. and yeah. let them melt. No, no. What? It's not yeah. wine ice balls. Grapes made, but it's grape made juice. Out of grapes. Yeah, but yeah, but they, there's no, they haven't fermented it. There's have a they? process. There's a crucial. If you give me grape juice and say it's basically the same as wine, I am going to be pissed off. By <laughs> yeah. <the way. laughs> Imagine if you ordered an AK-47 and you accidentally got AKB-48 turning up. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be so disappointed. That's a real mix-up in the Amazon warehouse. Yeah. <laughs> I can't eat grapes because they're too cold for my teeth anyway. Really? So Can this warm them up? Really? would be a nightmare. Well, you have to cut them open they're and then sort of lift them teeth. to warm them up. That's Anna, you, you're a pretty yeah. hard person in lots of ways. That is the most pathetic thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I've got sensitive teeth again. <laughs> wow, we found Anna's weakness after all these years. Yeah. That's it. It's my kryptonite. Grape tonight. Gosh. Mm. Um, has anyone heard of Avril Lavigne? Oh, this feels like a trick question. Yeah, this is I a have. trick question. Completely fake person. Doesn't no. exist. No, I'm joking. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I may not know who Leon Bridges is, but I do know who Avril Lavigne is. But what's um, this? She recorded a song called Dolphins. That If you go on these websites which give you lyrics to music... They give you the lyrics to this song, Dolphins. Uh, the lyrics go, Dolphins live in the ocean. Dolphins live in the sea. Dolphins live in nice, clear, blue sea. They are accompanied by lots of sea animals. We love them. You love them. I love them. Who doesn't like them? So this is the amazing lyrics to Avril Lavigne's Dolphins. Turns okay. out, doesn't exist. It's a completely made up <laughs> song that someone put into one of these lyrics websites and all the other lyrics websites oh, kind of took them on as well. Right. Um, this was in an article for Fusion online magazine. It's really, really good. I That's highly recommend really you read clever. it. Um, yeah. And there are two cover versions online of this song that doesn't exist. <laughs> There's no, no music for it. So people have had to guess what the melody is. So is it to expose these lyric websites for their copycattery? I genuinely think someone just did it for a laugh. Mm. I don't think there's anything behind it. Maybe really. to expose Avril Lavigne for her quite basic lyrics. Uh, excuse me, I yeah, would say well complicated. There. Well, okay, you can't just name your song complicated and claim. <laughs> 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 what can we do about the massive simplicity of these lyrics? I don't know. Call it complex. Oh, um, wait, okay. so do people think that she'd actually released it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Lots wow. of people thought because if you go on the lyrics website, you search all of Avril Lavigne's songs, you see mm -hmm. it. Unless you've got every single record that Avril Lavigne's ever 
release like I do, you're not mm-hmm. going to think, well, this is one I've never heard of. Yeah. B- b- bragging there about your Levine discography. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. I don't normally go on lyrics websites and search for an artist and then look no. through what they've got. What I normally do is I type in big blue shoe lyric misheard and then <laughs> that'll take me yeah. straight there. Yeah. But, yeah. but it's annoying when the lyric websites copy each other. I do grant yeah. you that. It's really annoying. I like it when a lyric website is handcrafted by one person <laughs> listening to a song, having a punt at the lyrics. Is that yeah. a thing? Yeah. Shit, maybe I've just been believing them and singing the wrong lyrics to, <laughs> you know, done bummy love, which... Dumb bummy love. Dumb bummy love. That's what I thought that was for oh, a long right. time. I Dumb to... bummy love. <laughs> Don't bummy love. <laughs> That's amazing. That's Dumb a very different love. song. Isn't yeah. it? Wow. <laughs> okay, it is time for our final fact of the show. That is. Andy. My fact is that before it was somewhere to go to powder your nose, a powder room was a room where you stuck your head through the wall to get your wig powdered. (laughs) Okay, so is there a hole for you to put your head in or do you have to smash your head through the wall? (laughs) That's what I'm currently thinking. In classy establishments, the hole is pre-provided for you and you just pop your head through. So there aren't many of these places around, obviously, because no one wears um, the big grey wigs anymore except lawyers, I guess, a few barristers still wear them. But there, there are a few places left, historical buildings, where they survive. Southside House is a manor house in Wimbledon in southwest London and it's got a lot of beautiful historical features and one of them is this weird cupboardy room which has a hole in the wall and you would stick your head through the wall and a servant in there would powder the wig for you right kind of I while couldn't you work wait. out uh, is the servant which i think was a young boy usually do they yeah. live there the whole time i couldn't work <laughs> that out i don't i'm they sure must be though, right? <laughs> it depends maybe if there's a regular wig powdering time or if yeah. you're it must be parties par- right you're having a party, if you want to <laughs> quickly get your wig repowdered yeah. yeah and why does it have to be a separate room are the wig wearers pretending it's like magic no, and you just big- put your head in i mean why do they need to be locking themselves in this well, have, have you read the process about how much powder goes into like the collateral powder of powder it's a mess, in a wig. Messy it goes situation. everywhere it's extraordinary yeah. i mean yeah. the opposite version of that is they used to have rooms um they, they found this in one case where you would sit inside in a barber's chair basically and through the hole in the wall would be your powderer effectively your hairdresser in a different room <laughs> applying the powder yeah. just through the hole and just smashing your face oh, wow. with it <laughs> and in order to not get it all over your clothes or all over your face you would wear gowns like you would in a salon mm. and you would wear a weird cone over your face yeah. to stop oh, the yeah, powder, powder from cone. Yeah, yeah exactly which um, makes you look like a really terrifying medieval doctor doesn't it like yes. the, pl- the plague mask the plague yeah. mask yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's yeah. very strange but presumably the poor servant in the cupboard is absolutely covered he's choking on powder by yeah. the end of the day yeah you'd guess so yeah the, the peruke powder page yes. which is what they were called really oh, yeah. 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 old name for a wig Ooh. kind of interesting actually like the word peruke uh, meant a wig by the 1560s but in the 1540s it meant a natural head of hair so hmm, in 20 years so that changed weird. and that word came from the italian word peruca which means wig yeah but the wigs were made of real heads of hair mm-hmm. because there were people selling their hair but also it was standard in much of society not just high society in lots of society for men to be wearing these big wigs mm. so not just the big wigs rather no exactly <laughs> <laughs> medium sized wig men wore big wigs <laughs> um but yeah human hair being sold for wigs was big business throughout this time and i was reading an account in 1840 written by a british writer and this was when wig wearing had really gone out of fashion in most places mm. but there are parts of france where it was still quite fashionable so this british writer went to Brittany. And it was like the most extraordinary thing about being in France is the peasant hair auctions. And what would happen is you'd have a marketplace in the middle of a town or a village and there'd be a whole queue of girls wanting to sell their hair. And the young girls would mount in turn, mount this platform in the middle and people would shout out bids. Wow. And after the highest bidder, the girl is shorn on the spot, apparently. Like a sheep. Like a sheep. (laughs) How much would the hair go for? As in, would it be more affordable for you to shave your head, sell your hair, and then use that money to buy a wig? No, with the selling of the someone's hair, someone's taking money there. There's a middleman. Yeah, you, that's what, which is what you don't want in business. But if the if the if the amount that your hair sells for 
greatly is outnumbers the amount you buy a wig for. I mean, if that's possible, the Nobel Prize in Economics is going to you. <laughs> it's a way of making money from nowhere. Well, look at these auctions. I mean, you know, they no, could go that, up and up, It doesn't right? work economically, unless you had much better quality hair yeah. than the wig you wanted to buy. Exactly. You could mm. sell your good hair and buy some shitty hair and you would make yeah. money that way. But what you're proposing <laughs> is the wig equivalent of a perpetual motion machine. <laughs> <laughs> it was partly expensive because it was hard to harvest so it's not like a crop which grows really fast and you can cut it down every year for hair to grow to the ideal length you sort of need two to four years growth depending on how much you want and so people would offer women advance payments because you've got to make sure you get that head of hair in four years time when it's lush so you'd pay in advance and say in four years i'll be back to chop that off but you'd have to keep an eye on your investment the whole time right to make sure that there's not anything I would sell my hair to multiple different people take all the down payments and then scarper and that would be my fraud yeah Mm. and the good thing is if you shave your head no one would recognize you (laughs) (laughs) the Romans used to get um, get hair from peasants didn't they Um, there was a vogue for blonde hair in Roman times and they went to the conquered sort of Germanic tribes and people even further north than that and they would take the blonde hair from there and then the um then really? expensive wigs would be made from them, yeah. And in the 16th century in Italy, blonde hair was really popular, but it was very hard to get hold of blonde wigs. And so what women would do is they would sit on the top of buildings in huge hats. They were called salanas. So there was a massive brim, but there was no top of the hat. Mm-hmm. So the sun could bleach their hair. Oh. oh. Isn't that interesting? Why did they have the massive hat? To stop you from getting um, tan skin. But also, you can lay out, if you've got long hair, you lay it out across the brim, oh, can't yes. you? So you're, tanning all, you're bleaching all your hair at the same time. Yeah, the yeah. suntan thing as well might have been. Well, I, I, for a suntan, you don't need a massive hat. You no. just need a hat that's got a brim. But yeah. massive, I'm picturing sort of an umbrella size. Yeah. Mm. I like Andy's theory. <laughs> <laughs> they used um, to be made of metal in the metal wigs the wig era yeah weird right sort of um long strands of tin or steel i think not many but it wasn't a big fashion but there are accounts aren't there of iron wigs yes that was the iron thing. wigs yeah uh, wow. edward wortley montague was an author and traveler he had an iron wig and um, there was an advertiser who said it could withstand rain, wind and hail and all without causing discomfort to the wearer, which feels like a bit of a stretch. Because mm-hmm. mm, the practical heavy. wig, though. But, and then they went out of fashion, didn't they? For various reasons. One, there was a wig tax. Wig powder tax, even. Sorry, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It was yeah. Pitt the Younger, wasn't it? Yeah, and there was a licensing system, like a TV I'll license. tell you what, if Pitt was a bit older, he wouldn't bother about wigs so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right for those young people to say no one should have wigs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it was roughly the cost of a modern TV license, I think. Right. It was one guinea a year, which I, that, I have read... TV bit, licenses? Well, about 150 <laughs> quid in modern money. And cool. so, I mean, there are obviously different ways of calculating it, but yeah, that's roughly it. Well, and the hope was that they were going to sort of use that money to fight Napoleon. Yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> did it? Worked. Did it? Did yeah, they get... it made a lot of money. Well, because I thought people just stopped doing it as a result. In the first year, it raised £200,000, which was a wow. lot. But then by 1869, it was only raising £1,000 a year as, as wig use had gone out. And you were exempt if you were royal or if you were a clergyman on less than £100 a year. There were various exemptions. and Yeah, know. the royals need the help, don't they, Means poor guys? <laughs> and also it allowed them to create a funny nickname, guinea pigs, because pigtails were all the rage. Uh, men used to wear them and it cost a guinea for the wig tax. That's... I mean, it's perfect. So was that the origin of guinea pigs in terms of... The animal. Uh, no, not the animal, <laughs> just in terms of that phrase, or is I that a completely separate phrase? No, what, wait, what do you mean in terms as of that d- phrase? D- the d- phrase to describe someone being a, like a lab rat. No, that oh, came from the fact that people experimented guinea on guinea pigs. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> but no, were people but already experimenting cool. on guinea pigs? Guys, where yeah. do you think that meaning of guinea pig would have come from the people who paid a wig tax? Because they were the first people They were the guinea pigs, they were, the guinea pigs. They were they testing the tax on them. No. It was human no, guinea pigs. No, no, it's from people testing drugs on guinea pigs. Dan, yeah. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm with you on this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I'm with me. I was just oh, asking no. whether or not there's a connection. The worst place to be is with Dan, but he's not on board. I'm not with myself. There's about a dozen early Nobel Prizes that were won by experiments on guinea pigs specifically. Right, okay. But this phrase is from the... Yeah, but that's late... not what it meant, though. Right, sorry, yeah. Here's the question. Where does pigs come in into your phrase of guinea pig pigs? Pigtails. People See, called them pigtails. Okay, great. Are you back on what? board with yourself, Dan? No, no I'm just learning. Great, great. I'm just what learning. we're not 100% sure of, and maybe we should go back and check the sources, is that in all those early 20th century medical sources, when they referred to testing on guinea pigs, maybe they actually were testing on these <laughs> overprivileged wig-wearing toffs. Yeah. 
Oh, we're I haven't just, checked. We're, um, all I'm saying is, was it a phrase that evolved and evolved to a new meaning, no. kind of like the wig? But no. turns out it's not. So, Andy, you're wrong. <laughs> wow. This is a sick bird. You're alone on the ship that Dan's built, then jumps. No! <laughs> um, but they went out of fashion. We know that by about the 1820s. But these weird little holdouts happened, didn't they, across society? So, coachmen kept going until the 1820s. Bishops stopped in 1832 by royal permission. Yeah. They said, we don't want to wear these anymore. <laughs> cool people who live in Hackney today, for instance, like myself, we're always wearing periwigs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's you guys and barristers, James, because... Baristas and barristers. Very, <laughs> nice. very strong. <laughs> nice. But from the mid-1840s onwards, it sort of had a resurgence in court. And you were in court, you were technically invisible unless you were wearing a wig. <laughs> you would what do you not, mean technically invisible? You would be, in quotes, not seen or heard. The judge would not recognise you. Wow. So it's a way of being invisible, basically. Oh, I don't know. Where is Lord Plinge? I can't see him anywhere. <laughs> exactly. like that. Basically that. Yeah, Amazing. Yeah. He's going, objection, objection, but he's not got his wig on. Um, <laughs> some barristers still wear wigs today. Yeah. And I read a great piece in the legal magazine called Counsel which is a great magazine and I, I recommend you all order order <laughs> it can I just this is brilliant but I just I'm remembering the thing about the Sellafield magazine a few weeks ago and I think this could be Andy's magazine corner be <laughs> 100% Sellafield magazine suddenly sounds like an agricultural kind of auction mag <laughs> doesn't it oh god another huge AK-47 AKB-48 thing all I'm, I'm just trying to sell a field and you've delivered uranium to me <laughs> now the Soviets are coming <laughs> put it with the unwanted gun in your pantry <laughs> Oh, look, anyway, Council Magazine wrote all about how wigs were nearly got rid of in court, right? So in uh -huh. 1940s, Parliament debated this clause, which was going to ban wigs and gowns in court. It said, this is ridiculous. So they went out 100 years ago in the rest of society. And um, it prompted this huge backlash. And lots of MPs, who are obviously very traditionalist as well, um, objected. One MP asked whether the clause would also deprive admirals of their three-cornered hats or deprive generals of their epaulets or clergymen of their distinctive attire. He said nothing about nurses, the person who had proposed this clause. He said nothing about nurses, although I think we all agree that they look very pretty in their distinctive attire. <laughs> oh my god. I know, the House of Commons stuff. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. Wow. But there was a fear that judges would look, not look majestic if they took their wigs off. Yeah. And that uh, if a judge was seen in his wig, he was embodying the law and very powerful. But if seen without one, he might look like a wizened up gargoyle. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. problem. That was really rough on judges. <laughs> um, wigs, a uh, big role in the civil rights movement in America. Oh. Um, hey. That is because during desegregation in the 60s, there are a lot of jobs where they kind of banned african-american hairstyles and they kind of said you had to comply with a certain hairstyle and so a lot of people had to wear wigs to kind of cover that up but then there were activists such as marcus garvey who said look this is ridiculous we can't be doing this one we need to stop people discriminating against hairstyles but two we need to kind of reclaim our hairstyle and and kind of be proud of it and he said don't remove the kinks from your hair remove them from your brain and then in the 1970s, there was kind of a resurgence of people reclaiming the, the African-American hairstyle. And then all the way to the present day in 2019, New York became the second state to ban discrimination on hairstyles. So in California and New York right now, you're not allowed to discriminate on anyone due to their hairstyle. And that is going back to the civil rights movement wow. and all that stuff. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know we were allowed to do that before. You would think not, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. We've been taking the piss out of people with pigtails left, right and centre. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys know about the Wig Club? No. No. It was founded in 1775 in Edinburgh and there was a really cool investigation into it by an author called David Stevenson and it was a gentleman's sex club. And I mean, no, I haven't heard of it. No, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, it was a good test and well done. You all passed. It was named after a wig that they had as their kind of relic, their club relic that okay. was made from the pubic hair of Charles II's mistresses oh that had apparently been worn by Charles II. Okay. And when oh. you joined the wig club as part of your initiation, you had to provide locks of pubic hair suitably harvested to be added to the wig as proof of having triumphed sexually. So you had to, wow. after triumphing sexually, I guess, say to the woman, sorry, do you mind if I snip off a curl of your pubic hair? Because oh. I'm hoping to join a sex club. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely do that afterwards, I would say. 
um and yeah they just met and uh talked about how much sex they were having and drank a lot these they guys had... sound great <laughs> yeah uh, so no actual sex happened at the wig club it was just a bunch of <laughs> virgins <discussion>. getting together <laughs> <laughs> bringing cut locks from their dogs yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah I shagged hard last night man is that what it was yeah yeah it's a really cool club to be a member of yeah okay. <laughs> look i would have applied i'm not gonna lie <laughs> <laughs> Some wigs were d- made of duck's tail feathers. Oh, yeah. Wigs for, specifically for parsons and vicars. Okay. Um, yeah. Had, because it was to fight off the wet, because obviously water off a duck's back. Oh, clever. But they literally had a duck's oh, arse at the front of their head, really? looking so stupid. <laughs> I mean, amazing, yeah. It is quite clever, though, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. What animal's hair would you have as a wig, if you could have any? <sighs> Peacock. And just let it go. Yeah. Full. Nice. Full peacock. That's a good idea. Well, is it a peacock's tail that you've got? No, yeah. I've missed that bit. Just the oh, you just want the shitty the bit ordinary we plumage. Of it. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, That's cool. Would that be whenever you clench your teeth, it fans out? Whenever you tense your head, yeah, oh, that's a good idea. I would have thought like you'd come in from the cold, take your hat off, and it kind of comes yes. out. <laughs> yes, in fan. Jack in a box. Yeah, I'd probably get an orangutan. Oh yeah, they've got lovely orange. Orange hair. They do, don't oh, they? Yeah. Always wanted to be a ginger. Mm. Don't know, very wiry orangutan hair. It looks How do wiry. You know? It How looks do wiry you from know? a distance. It's got a pubic quality about it. Ooh. Well, you could bring it to your wig party, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking yak, just because it's so long and luscious. That, and, ah, yeah. lovely. Yeah. And wise. Wise. <laughs> just a yak wise like wise. a yak. <laughs> <laughs> Not saying? <laughs> it is now. <laughs> Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. James. At James Harkin. And Anna. You can email podcast at qi.com. Yep. Or you could go to our group account, which is at no such thing, or our website, no such thing as a fish.com. All of our previous episodes are up there, so do check them out. Also, go to the link that gives you the tour dates for our upcoming 2021 tour. It starts in October. See if we're coming to a town or city near you, and hopefully we'll see some of you there. Okay, that's it. We'll be back again next week with another episode. We'll see you then. Goodbye. Goodbye.